See how stale this bread is? This is definitely something that ends up in the garbage in people's homes, but there's a lot of great ways to use it. Hey everyone, I'm Dan Giusti. Today I'm being challenged to cook several super cheap dishes using <laughs> white bread. I spent most of my career traveling around the world working in a lot of really cool restaurants using a lot of crazy ingredients. Now I spend most of my time trying to find ways to make great food on a budget. And that's what we're gonna be doing today. One loaf of bread, six different preparations, all under $2 a piece. Let's get it done. First up, I'm gonna show you a more advanced technique using fresh breadcrumbs to add texture to a dish. We're gonna do that by making a preparation we're referring to as the bread butter blanket. That is not a technical term. I don't know what this is actually called. I learned this in a restaurant that I worked at in Las Vegas. That's a two Michelin star restaurant. And they had a fancy name for it and it was in French. But because I don't speak French, we're calling it the bread butter blanket. So we're gonna make fresh bread crumbs. It's just fresh bread in the food processor. We make it till it's a fine meal. Nice and fine. We take 50% fresh breadcrumbs, 50% unsalted butter that we've let sit out at room temperature. Otherwise, it's just not gonna mix. If it's cold butter, it's just not gonna work. And then we garnish it with whatever we want. In this case, we're adding chopped chives. We mix it together into a cohesive paste. That's what we have. We have a cohesive ball. We roll it between two pieces of parchment paper into a flat sheet. You don't want the crust to be thick. I would say get this as thin as you can get it where it stays together. So I'm gonna continue to roll it. It's good. We nailed it. Yeah. If you don't have a rolling pin, a bottle of wine would be great to use as a substitute rolling pin for this. Because not everybody has a rolling pin. I don't, I would say I use a rolling pin maybe once a week, but that's only because I made I make this once a week. Just because I sleep under it, but that's a different story. We're gonna go ahead and put this in the freezer, let it set up, and then we're ready to go. So when I first learned about the bread butter blanket, we were putting it on lobster in the restaurant that I was working at, which obviously is not the most affordable ingredient, but again, it's very versatile. In this case, we're putting it on this flounder. It doesn't need to necessarily go on seafood. You could put it on vegetables, you could put it on a piece of beef as well. It's breadcrumbs, butter, and whatever else you wanna put in it. So if you can imagine that combination with whatever other ingredient you see, it will work. And for what it's worth, this flounder is super inexpensive. It was previously frozen, which people think might mean it's not high quality, but it is. This fish is caught in the ocean. It's filleted there on the boat, flash frozen on the boat. So it's super fresh. And if you thaw it out properly, you have a great product to work with. Again, this technique is something I learned in a very fancy restaurant and they do really fancy things that people pay a lot of money for. This did not cost us a lot of money to do and it looks super sharp. So this is ready for the oven now. Fish is done. Flounders cooked, crust on top is nice and golden brown. There we go. We'll give it a taste. It's not too strong in flavor. We taste the chives, it's seasoned properly. And of course the butter and the bread gives it a nice richness and texture. It's super delicate, it just falls apart, just like you want a crust to fall apart. There's no question this is a fine dining technique, but as you can see, it doesn't need to be exclusive to a restaurant. This is something you can do at home very easily and really take your cooking to another level. So what do you do when you have bread that is hard as a rock like this? Well, there's a few ways to use it very creatively. One way is to use it to thicken things like soups or sauces. And to show you that, we're gonna make ribolita, which is a traditional Tuscan soup. The way we're making it today isn't necessarily exactly how it's always classically made, but in the end, it's a very simple vegetable soup that's made a little heartier by the addition of stale bread. First things first with this soup are the vegetables. We don't need too many vegetables. We're only making about four portions. We're gonna cut about an eighth of a cup of carrots, an eighth of a cup of celery, and then we're gonna go ahead and cut our onion. And that's like a very standard base for these types of dishes. If, if you're missing one of these, it's not the end of the world. This is a very versatile thing. You can add whatever vegetables you have. And if you don't have one of these, it shouldn't be the reason that you don't make the soup. Ribolita is like, if you look it up, it's gonna have a traditional, oh, you have to have kale, you have to have cannellini beans. Okay, fine, then don't call it ribolita, call it something else, call it a vegetable soup. All that's important is you're making something that's delicious and you enjoy eating it. So we have all these aromatics, 
These are gonna go into the pan with olive oil and we're going to sweat these aromatics. So what does sweating mean? That means that we're gonna cook them very slowly on low heat so they don't get any color. We don't wanna roast these in the pan. We don't wanna develop that kind of flavor with these vegetables. We just wanna soften them. The next thing to do will be to add crushed tomatoes, cannellini beans, and water. We're going with crushed tomatoes versus whole tomatoes for a few reasons. Strangely enough, crushed tomatoes are significantly much more inexpensive than a whole plum tomato. This is cheaper and it's processed the way we want it, ready to go. For something like this, we want a tomato that's processed. We, we're not putting whole tomatoes in here. That wouldn't make sense. Crushed tomatoes, you'll see, they're kind of broken. It creates a much lighter taste, a lighter texture. That's what we want for tomato sauce. That's what we want for this. And then finally, water. People are always talking about when it comes to cooking, chicken stock, this beef stock, all these kinds of stocks. When I went to culinary school, everything had chicken stock in it. It's this idea that chicken stock is gonna add more flavor. Well, you might argue it adds more flavor, but I would argue it detracts from the other flavors that you're trying to promote. So water for this makes tons of sense. We're gonna go ahead and add the crushed tomatoes. We're gonna add the beans. We're gonna add the water to get the rest of the tomato. Spill half the water on the stove. That's a traditional Italian good luck charm. We're gonna slowly bring that up to a simmer. We're using two cups of kale. Yeah, there's a recipe and we have numbers, but these are the kind of things that you do what you want. I mean, you want more kale, put more kale. So as I mentioned, this is kind of like a riff on ribolita. And at this point, we're kind of following the tradition and the next step would be to add stale bread directly to the soup as a way to kind of thicken it. And what a better piece of bread to add than the end, the piece of bread that nobody uses for anything we're gonna use it for ribolita. We're just gonna break it up in here and just bring it to a boil. And it's just gonna break down in here. And all it's gonna do is thicken the soup and it's gonna make it heartier. Again, we're talking about a vegetable soup that now is becoming very substantial, substantial enough to be a main dish. We're also going to top it with some bread. We're gonna finish it with a touch more olive oil and some Parmesan cheese, some grated cheese. So this is going into the oven uh, on the broiler setting so it bakes nice and also takes on the heat from the top so it toasts nicely as well. All right, so the ribolita is out of the oven. The bread got nice and toasty on top. The cheese melted, got some nice caramelization. And then beneath is this beautiful kind of stew soup-like thing. So we're just gonna get in there. It's very clean flavored. You taste the vegetables. You taste the kale. As much as this is a small bowl of soup, you could argue, I think it's a meal. And for under $2 a portion, it's very inexpensive to make. So instead of throwing your stale bread away, add it to something like a sauce or a soup to make it more substantial and heartier. Next up, I'm gonna show you a great way to use stale bread to add texture to dishes. We're gonna be making one fine breadcrumb used for breading two coarse types of breadcrumbs, one sweet and one savory, to finish dishes. So we're gonna get right into making seasoned breadcrumbs for breading. So we are breaking this up just to make it a little easier on the food processor, because I have troubles using the food processor. Let me see. Nothing like a food processor to make you just look like a donkey when you don't know how to use it. There's what we're looking for are fine pieces and then some kind of coarser pieces about this size. So we're gonna take this and now we're gonna pass it through our colander. What we want are the fine breadcrumbs to come out the bottom and the coarse ones to stay in the colander. You can do this when you have one or two pieces of stale bread left over. You don't need to make this big batch. So maybe you have one or two pieces of bread, you can process them, put them in a container in the freezer and every time you have leftover bread, you can do the same thing. And when you accumulate a lot of breadcrumbs, you have a whole batch ready to go. I'm gonna pour off the coarse crumbs. So you can see the ratio here. Uh, there's definitely more fine crumbs. You'll also notice that I made a mess. So we are doing Italian seasoning breadcrumbs. So we've got black pepper, salt, we've got garlic powder, onion powder, dried oregano, and dried parsley. Super simple, and that's it, that's done. So obviously we can use these seasoned breadcrumbs for a variety of preparations. For example, we can make a really simple, delicious chicken cutlet. So we purchased chicken cutlets from the store. We have a little twist here on the breading process. We're actually gonna go into egg first and then into flour, then into egg again, and then finish with our seasoned breadcrumbs. This makes kind of a more distinct coating on the outside, which I really think is delicious. We've seasoned the egg with Parmesan cheese, which definitely gives it a nice flavor, I'm sure you can imagine. And then we're gonna shallow fry them until they are very nice and crispy. We're ready to go. Two chicken cutlets. 
So now we're gonna make two types of coarse breadcrumbs, and we're gonna refer to them as finishing breadcrumbs. Basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna season them and use them to kind of jazz up a dish. So we're gonna start with the sweet finishing crumbs. We put the olive oil in the pan. We have our coarse crumbs. We just wanna toast them lightly. Once they start to toast a little bit, we're gonna go ahead and add slivered almonds. Now a little quick tip, when you go down the baking aisle and you look for nuts, they sell tiny little packets. It's perfect to make a small batch of something like this. You open the package, you use the nuts, and then that's it. Instead of buying a big canister of nuts that you might eat some, and nuts are a kind of thing that they're perishable. They're loaded with fat and oils. So after a while, they go stale. So it's good to buy nuts, use them, and then move on. So we're gonna go ahead and put those toasted crumbs and almonds in the refrigerator just for a few minutes, just so they get cold before we add the chocolate, because otherwise the chocolate will melt. We've left the chocolate in large chunks. And these are gonna be something you can use to say finish ice cream. You could use them to even put on top of your yogurt. Similar to say like a granola. Got some vanilla ice cream. We're gonna get a nice healthy scoop. And we're gonna say about a tablespoon of these finishing crumbs. Make sure we get some on top, some on the side. Very nice. There we have it. Mmm, that's good. And again, this is super cost effective for about a tablespoon of these crumbs costs like 15 cents. So, you know, you pay for your ice cream and then you have this super cheap, delicious, luxurious topping. So now we're gonna make savory crumbs. I've got a pan on the heat. We're gonna start with a little bit of olive oil just to allow us to get a nice toast on the crumb. We're kind of just getting the rest of the moisture out. There's a difference between something when you eat it and it's stale and when it's toasted and crispy. So while these toast a little bit, I'm just gonna chop the parsley. So I'm actually gonna turn the heat off. We're pretty much there. That happened really fast. So I'm gonna go ahead and grate this garlic clove. And we're also not gonna recommend that you grate the tips of your fingers, which I just did. Transfer the crumbs, and we're just gonna zest some lemon right in here. We're gonna add our parsley, and we're gonna use these crumbs to top roasted yellow squash and zucchini. Very underrated vegetables, primarily because I think oftentimes when you eat these, they become kind of soggy. And then because they are underutilized and they are underappreciated, they are very inexpensive, which is great for us because they're delicious. We're gonna roast them in the oven and then make sure to flip them halfway through. The crumbs are perfect for zucchini and yellow squash because when you cook them, they are still on the softer side and that's why they're perfect with these crumbs because they had a lot of texture. And there you go. It's delicious, it's super simple. I would say the thing that stands out most to me with this is the lemon zest in the crumbs is super delicious here. It's enough to make this go from just a really kind of plain, boring dish to something that has a lot going on. Super simple way to really bring a dish to another level. So using stale bread that would have most likely ended up in the garbage to come up with three types of breadcrumbs, not only is cost effective and you're not being wasteful, but beyond that, it almost pushes you to be a little creative and take your cooking at home to the next level. Next up, we're gonna see how we can use bread as a vehicle for flavor. What we're kind of talking about is looking at bread like a sponge. It sucks in all different types of flavors. So in this case, we're making bread pudding. So we are using, again, slightly stale bread here. This isn't hard. It's probably at a point now where you wouldn't wanna make a sandwich out of it, but it works perfectly for a preparation like this. And when you eat a bread pudding, you really want it to be nice and soft and easy to eat. So I prefer to use bread that's not overly stale. You could use fresh bread here. And honestly, white bread, because of its soft nature, is very ideal for something like this. We have a little bit of milk, heavy cream, an egg, sugar, some cinnamon, nutmeg, and vanilla. With this kind of recipe, you are soaking bread. The bread is gonna take on all these flavors. So whatever you wanna put in it and whatever you enjoy tasting, you can add to it. Some people like to put alcohol, maybe like a touch of bourbon, that's really tasty. We're just gonna make sure this is incorporated evenly and then we're gonna let it sit. Why this sits, we're gonna go ahead and chop up some chocolate. You don't want this mix to be dry. You're gonna look at this mix and you're gonna say, wow, it's pretty wet. That's what we want. If you have a dry mix and you bake it, it's gonna make a dry bread pudding. We are gonna get a little fancy and we're gonna put them in individual ramekins. I actually think one of these has substantially less mix than the others, but that's the one you give to the person you don't like so much. Now we're ready to go into the oven. We are baking at a low temperature. So our bread pudding is finished. Okay, this is delicious, but I don't think it's really a complete dessert without a sauce. So sometimes you see when people make sauces for bread pudding, they'll make some kind of like, it's called creme anglaise, it's like a custard. So it's more or less milk, sugar, thickened with eggs that you cook over the stove and then strain it. So it's a, 
It's a process. I'd almost argue that sometimes you see bread puddings where the sauce itself is more of a process than the bread pudding, which for me doesn't make much sense. So instead of saying, okay, we're gonna make a bread pudding, we gotta do this, that, and the other thing, and you gotta make a sauce on top of that, and you gotta get a whole bunch of ingredients to make a sauce, Sweet and condensed milk, sauce in a can. Works perfectly for this. It's cheap, you can use what you don't use for this to make iced coffee, it's delicious. We're just gonna take a spoon for each bread pudding. I'm just gonna kind of swirl it around in here. There we have it. The best part of making bread pudding, tasting it, it's great. First thing I recognize straight away is it's nice and soft. The base is not too sweet. And we have some nice pockets of chocolate in here that are just melted. I think using soft bread is the way to go here and using bread that maybe is just slightly stale. Even things like potato rolls, like potato hot dog rolls or hamburger buns would be perfect for something like a bread pudding. It really just makes for a delicate bite and that's really what we're looking for when we're making this kind of dessert. So on top of the fact that this is a delicious and easy to make dessert, it costs less than a dollar to make per portion. So there you have it, one loaf of white bread, a variety of creative, affordable, and approachable preparations. I really hope today's recipes make you think twice the next time you're gonna throw away some leftover bread, and that you can use those recipes to take your home cooking game to another level.